Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and so uh, we're moving right along here in our discussion of Jordan Peterson's uh, Maps of Meaning. And uh, we're moving into a section now where he's going to get into these three specific archetypes uh, backing his triad, the Great Mother, uh, the Son, and the Great Father. And the Great Mother uh, is going to be associated with nature and the realm of the unexplored. Uh, the Son is the knower, the explorer, who translates her realm into uh, the realm of the known, maps of meaning that orient one in time and space, and uh, the realm of the Great Father, which is the realm associated with the past, with the laws and formulations and so forth that have been already created and which are stiffening and petrified and in need of a hero to come along, slay the dragon, and release the waters and revivify the situation. Um, what Peterson does, though, uh, is he sets up what uh, Peter Sloterdijk calls a metaphysical bivalent ontology. And that is when you have, in the Western logocentric metaphysical tradition, the whole thing has been powered by uh, polaristic dyads. And in any given dyad, uh, there's always one pole that's favored over the other. As, for example, Derrida points out, uh, the logocentric tradition has favored the opposition of speech versus writing, in which speech is favored over writing because speech is closer to the metaphysics of presence of the voice. It's therefore privileged. Writing is seen as something secondary something supplemental to speech, something not quite as close to the originating archive as speech is. And um, that would be one example. So what Derrida does is to go in when he deconstructs is to take one of these bivalent ontologies and to show that it's really a false opposition because uh, the one aspect can be found inside the other and vice versa, thereby undermining their absolute metaphysical opposition um, and we've seen what the 20th century can do with absolute metaphysics. They get very, uh, both on the left and on the right, they, they can get quite, quite violent. Um, so culture and nature, then. He associates nature with the female and culture with the male. And this is a sort of Jungian bias that, that he has inherited. Joseph Campbell inherited the same bias when he said that uh, women represent nature. They don't need to become something. They are something. They, they are something that simply is. The male uh, is not something. He has to go out. He's like a, a blank slate. He has to go out and uh, inscribe himself uh, into the social order, inscribe himself with signifiers, and accomplish something. This is why you get, for example, in Picasso, you get the, the wonderful reclining nude woman, this splendorous, splendorous object of beauty, and the artist is the one who translates her into a representational ideogram in his art. He is becoming something. She simply is something. So we have this old chauvinist, worn-out bias left over from the logocentric metaphysical age here that is in need, I think, of deconstructing. So what we want to do is take the dyad of culture and nature and show that there are plenty of masculine elements that can be associated with nature, just as there are plenty of female elements that can be associated with culture. It's not an abs as absolute as Peterson wants you to believe here. In nature, for instance, we have plenty of nature deities in mythology, and it's mythology here that he's mainly concerned with that are associated with all kinds of natural phenomena. Sky gods and thunder hurlers are almost invariably male. Uh, we've got Thor, Indra, Yahweh, Zeus, Baal, Teshub, all these wonderful thunder hurling storm gods who come in. And we've got, um, we've got earthquake gods such as Poseidon and Jeb, who are the great earthquake gods, rumbling everything underneath as the storms come in up above. Uh, we've got moon gods like Osiris, and we've got uh, nature gods like Dionysus. Dionysus is nature. He is the representation of the bestial aspect of nature. He's associated with the phallus and associated with wild, rampant sexuality, uh, and he's associated with lots of animals, especially panthers. Um, and panthers, because of the starry, the leopard anyway, the, the starry leopard pelt skin that becomes associated with the cult of Dionysus, is the image of the starry night sky another masculine nature attribute. And uh, the equivalent of Dionysus, of course, in India is Shiva. Shiva is the great god of nature. He is an anti-cultural deity par excellence. Uh, he comes in off the mountains, the shaggy, uh, wandering sannyasin who is, has nothing to do with culture and no interest in it. He's turned away from the village and gone into the forest, and he's associated with the burning grounds, with cremation and burial. And in the triad associated with... Uh, um, Brahma, uh, Shiva, and Vishnu. Vishnu is the great culture god there. He's, 
he's asleep and his dream is the world. And he has these 10 incarnations that he cycles through. And each of the incarnations is associated with an avatar that comes into the world to achieve something that uh, strengthens human culture or advances the evolution of consciousness in some way. Such as, for example, when uh, the Earth Goddess is captured by the elephant demon. He comes along, captures her, carries her back down under, underneath the ocean. And uh, Vishnu has to transform himself into the boar who dives down into the ocean and uses his tusks to dig up the Earth Goddess and bring her back to the surface so that she can become Pangaea, basically the continent that gives birth to nature, the nature principle there again. But he's associated with culture, and all his deeds are cultural, such as when he incarnates as Rama. Uh, his wife Sita is abducted by the demon Ravana and taken to Sri Lanka, and he has to go in and get her. And in doing so, he sets up an alliance with the monkeys, with the monkey kingdom who built a bridge for him from India to Sri Lanka to go and get her. All these wonderful cultural deeds that Vishnu is associated with. But Shiva is not. Shiva is the god who is associated with the destruction. Uh, there's a myth that recounts the, the ceremony of Daksha. Daksha throws a great party and he invites all the gods and goddesses. Everyone is invited except Shiva because he's this dirty, smelly yogi from the woods that nobody wants around. So all the gods are having a great time, and uh, Shiva uh, is very angered by not being invited. So he shows up, and he just destroys everything and everyone, uh, becomes a spree killer, basically, shoots thunderbolts, mangles the gods. Many of them receive permanent deformities and injuries uh, as a result of his uh, striking back, this uh, nature principle that has scorn for culture. What is culture, after all, but something that is blown away by nature? And so Shiva comes in as this force of nature and just blows everything to pieces. So there we have the masculine associated with nature once again. And I think everything, all of these aspects that can be associated with both Dionysus and Shiva, I think Peterson tends to just lump in and squash into the category of the great mother. Uh, and I think this is one of the problems with, uh, with Jungianism, with Jungian psychoanalysis, is that it tends to lean toward this, it tends to produce this sort of cookie mold archetypal aspect where all the archetypes are these cookie molds, the great mother, uh, the wise old man, the crone, the quarry, that all of these archetypes, that all of this phenomena tend to get squashed into, and it tends to sort of relieve the, the hermeneutician of having to dig into the context to see what all the different wonderful various meanings of these things might be. Uh, Peterson at one point quotes Eric Neumann who talks about the goddess and all these creatures that are associated with the terrible mother, uh, snakes, panthers, lions, crocodiles, harpies, all these creatures that are associated with the power of the terrifying aspect of the goddess and the great mother. But when you look at these signifiers, all of these things mean something. They don't just mean the terror of the great mother. Uh, snakes, for example, in Indian myth are, are known as nagas. They represent the watery principle that flees from Vishnu in the form of his Garuda bird, the sun bird, that chases after them and represents the sun drying up the waters of the earth. It's not just a simple thing associated with the cult of the goddess. Panthers, as we have said, are associated with the starry night sky. Lions are solar animals. Sometimes they're associated with the goddess, as they are uh, with the cult of Sibylle. They, were, uh, they pulled her chariot, so lions were associated with her there. But note that the sphinx in Egypt is male. The great sphinx that is associated with the fourth dynasty um, and the Great Pyramid is 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 male. Uh, that it's it's a male creature there. The Sphinx says it appears in Greek myth as female. That Oedipus encounters when he arrives to solve the riddle of the Sphinx. She is indeed female. She's a female monster. But monsters are not always female. Um, just because they're terrors from the underworld does not necessarily associate them with a female valency. In fact, as a matter of fact, throughout mythology, most dragons are male. Indra slaying Vritra. Vritra is a male. A being, uh, Siegfried slaying Fafnir, the giant who has devolved because of his greed into a dragon, and Siegfried slays him, uh, or Thor in his fight with the great world encircling Midgard serpent. Most of these dragons are male because they represent the principle of inquisitiveness, of greed, of grabbing things and holding on to them. And it's the sort of male, worn out principle of holding on to the past that Jordanson, Jordan Peterson says that the Great Father represents, but here we are with the dragon that he says is almost always associated with the Great Mother, and as a matter of fact, it absolutely is not. And many of these chimeric-type creatures that appear mean something, 
Um, just because they're hybrids doesn't mean that they're just random uh, monsters sent by Gaia. Uh, lots, most of the signifiers that they are uh, glued together with have are, are signifiers that have come from various cults, for instance. Uh, the cult of the, the serpent uh, goddess might come along and interfuse with the cult of the bull god or a lion cult or whatever the various cults might be. And many times these monsters represent different historical strata with layers of cults and religiosity, one piling up on top of the other in a specific geographical locale that the monster slayer might encounter. And Greek myths is full of this, as Robert, anyone who's read Robert Graves on Greek myth knows. So these monsters don't just represent the goddess. And the harpies, yes, the harpies will say, uh, the harpies are female, uh, but as Gene Gebser wonderfully points out in the ever-present origin, winged beings tend to be associated with what he calls the soul's death pole. Uh, winged beings like harpies and uh, any kind of winged monstrosity that shows up tends to represent the soul's death pole, whereas images of flowing water, springs that are associated with the muses and so forth, tend to represent the soul's life pole. So there's a polaristic opposition there in the mythical consciousness structure that Gebser wonderfully uh, excavated, I think. Um, so nature is not always male, and I think it, it, it's not always male or female. It just depends on the context and the purpose of the myth and what the monster is associated with. He says, for instance, that Freud's libido, Freud's id, um, is the great mother, and it most certainly is not. I think the, the id for Freud definitely has a masculine connotation. It means it really does, I think, mean raw male sexual power of the kind that Camille Paglia described as having powered civilization. Uh, for him, his miniature dragon slayer myth of the ego, taming and slaying the id uh, and the superego and its relationship between them, where id was, their ego shall be. I, I think that for Freud, there very much is in his mind the myth of the son slaying the father as in the case of Totem and Taboo, where he invents this myth about the primal horde. The primal horde is something that uh, is this den of sort of cavemen, and the father has access to all the women, and all of his sons decide to kill him and murder him and overthrow him and create a communion meal out of his body. Uh, and then myth and ritual comes out of a remembrance of that primordial act. Um, Freud very much had on his mind the, this unknown, the association of the unknown with uh, this the son slaying the father, very, very much so. Um, so I don't think we can just associate nature, uh, just assign a female valency to it and have done with it. I, I, there's a lot of context-dependent specific meaning going on here. And as far as culture goes, associating with female, we have the Athene, the female principle. Athene is the great principle of Athens. Uh, she's the principle who guides and protects warriors. She protects Achilles. She protects Odysseus. She represents Athens and civilization in opposition to the Furies, who represent in Aeschylus's Oresteia the principle of, of uh, the matriarchy, uh, but she represents the, this new thing, the Athenian uh, rupture, the Athenian singularity. And we have all the muses. The nine muses are all associated with different kinds of poetry, Calliope with ep epic poetry, Cleo with history, Erato with lyric poetry, Euterpe with music, Melpomene with tragedy, and so on. Uh, those are all cultural products. Uh, and they are all associated with the muses, and the muses are the source of culture in that sense. So there we have another example of the female being associated with cultural production. Later, this changes. Uh, if you look at early uh, Greek epics like uh, Homer's uh, Iliad and uh, the Homeric hymns and so forth, the, the muses are in Hesiod, the muses are invoked at the start, but in the later epics, such as in Apollonius uh, from, of Rhodes's Argonautica, he's invoking Apollo. Uh, so there's a gender, a gender shift that goes on there. But um, I think we can, there, there are many instances of associating the, the female principle with culture. Uh, the Hindu goddess Sarasvati was the goddess of eloquent speech. And the original earliest goddess of writing, the earliest deity of writing actually that we know of was female, Mizaba, who was the goddess not only of grain, but also of, of writing. And uh, so there, there are plenty of female associations uh, with culture, just as there are many associations of the male principle with nature. So I don't think it's just a, a simple thing that we can associate uh, uh, the, these, these genders. They, they just slide off. These transcendental signifieds in our civilization now are melting, and they're freeing up new creative energies and new possibilities for people to experiment with. 
So we're getting lots of transgen transgender experiments uh, where men and women are experimenting with being the, the opposite sex while they're biologically incarnate. Lots of wonderful ex cultural experimentation is going on, which I think Peterson simply regards here as chaos. It's social chaos. It's the female. He associates the female with terror and the new and anxiety and novelty and the thing that always has to be overcome and slain. I think it's interesting when you look at a film like uh, Darren Aronofsky's Mother, for instance, which is a film, a recent film, uh, in which the story is told entirely from the point of view of a woman who happens to be the wife of a poet. And the poet, uh, she doesn't understand the mystery of his ability to create this poetry. Um, he's totally baffling to her. And the film does a sort of timeline compression of the entire life of a poet as though we're on fast forward. And uh, he's publishing books and it's attracting an audience. And then a cult comes in, invades the house. And she's just in a state of continual terror at not the great mother, but at a very masculine principle, the principle of poetic creativity that this individual, her husband, uh, is living out and through. And it's utterly overwhelming to her and terrifying to her. Eventually they have a child. The child is in good Dionysiac fashion, torn to pieces and eaten, consumed in a kind of communion meal because she feels like this is her being, that she's being eaten. She's being consumed. She can't give birth to anything that can match his creative output. And so there's a wonderful gender slippage there where uh, the thing that is the unknown that caught, that is the source of anxiety and terror to the protagonist is male. It's masculine. It's not the great mother. It's the, the father in his mode of creating with the paternal vulva, and the female there is, is totally floored by it. So these gender slippages are... And the film Annihilation, I think, is interesting too. Another recent film that came along in which the unknown there is definitely equivalent to the great mother. I think the, the shimmer that comes along and produces all these biological mutations and ultimately uh, when the protagonist goes down and sees... Uh, in the lighthouse, what's going on there? There's this sort of vulvic thing that's spewing forth all these productions. The 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 unknown there it definitely does fit Peterson's model. That is the great mother, um, but the protagonist is female. She's in the role of a kind of female dragon slayer, and so it's the female, uh, not the male hero protagonist, Jason, Hercules, Theseus. Not that mode at all. Uh, it's the female dragon slayer going in to find this female mystery which she never does solve and she never does understand. So it's never translated into a cognitive map uh, that's conquered the way Peterson presents all of this. Uh, so anyways, those are my reflections on this uh, chapter.